everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Crime and Coffee Couple. My name's Allison. And my name is Mike. Hello, Mike. Hello, dear. How are you? I'm doing quite well. How are you? Oh, great, great. Um, you know, now that you've acknowledged me for the first time today, and it's uh, like, what, 2.38 p.m.? So. Oh, when did you get here? Oh, yeah, I know. That's kind of the whole life I lead. I'm just kidding. Uh, you acknowledged me plenty. I so sure did. I um, gave you a little sweet smooch on your head this morning when you were leaving with our son for baseball. Oh, that's always nice. That's like one of those things you know that you're loved if you're kissed on the head or something, mm-hmm. which is nice. You don't get a lot of that for me because I'm much taller. Six two, six foot two. Yeah, inches. so unless you're sitting, it's not happening. Yeah. So I, I do that too all the time though. Yeah, you're about twelve inches taller than me. Yeah. Uh, enough of the mushy stuff, I guess. Uh, but thank you for listening. We are a weekly true crime podcast. Uh, sometimes we'll drink a coffee. I hold hence the uh, coffee name. We both have our coffee. Is that another one of those double espresso uh, shaken? Um, yes, I only put one shot of espresso in this one since it's treading on three p.m. We gotta, you know, we can't play with bedtime here. Yeah, no, no. It's uh, anytime after noon. It's like all right, time to cut out the caffeine. But it is a Saturday. We're recording a day early, so you know you got a little flexibility there. Yeah, absolutely. That's why I've had my my third coffee in the last I think four. 40 minutes. So that's, that's going to be interesting tonight. See how that goes. Maybe mm-hmm. I should go take a jog somewhere. Yeah. It, it's run only, it off. It's only 98 degrees outside. So yeah. why not? All Our right. daughter's at Bush Gardens and I was checking the weather for her and it's like, there is a heat advisory in place. I'm like, ooh, glad it's you and not me. I think there's a heat advisory pretty much everywhere. Oh, it's disgusting. Is it just the US or is yeah. it like everywhere? Uh, I don't even think it's just the US. I was checking Chicago weather the other day. It was like 75 degrees for a high. So oh, we're okay. all, we're the only ones in hell here. I, I think Texas, maybe California too. Yeah, you're, you're probably right. I have I've seen that. I don't know if it's current, yeah. but anyway, it's it's awful. Yeah. But um, we're here. Yeah, we sure are. And I'll say one thing uh, right before we started. I was really excited and I was whistling the Barbie tune because we're going to go see Barbie on Sunday. Tomorrow, uh, yes. Tomorrow, which is probably when you're listening to this. So we'll we be, have our tickets. If you're listening to this, when it just comes out, we will be probably an hour from seeing Barbie. No, we'll be in the theater because this, the theater, the movie starts at 10 a.m. and our episode releases right around that time. Right, 9, 9.30-ish. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So, How do you yeah. feel about going to see Barbie? <laughs> you know what's weird? I was thinking about that and I'm very excited. I don't know why. I think it's because there's a lot of talk about it, a lot of advertising. All my friends and I were kind of talking about Barbie and Oppenheimer or Oppenheimer. I don't mm-hmm. know how you say it. But those are the two huge movies this weekend. And yeah. it's, you know, I, I guess movies haven't been doing so well uh, recently, but I'm like, there's a bunch of crappy movies. That's why they're not doing well like indiana jones sucked from what i heard um the last good movie that came out was like Guard- guardians of the galaxy 3 mm-hmm. and that was fantastic so go see it if you haven't um my coworker went to see oppenheimer 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 um on thursday and she said it was funny because people dressed up for that in like suits and then there were people on the flip side with barbie wearing like all pink and such <laughs> yeah, that's kind of fun you know you can make fun of it it's stupid as you think it is but i think it's kind of fun like i don't it's really something fun i don't own anything pink are you wearing something pink? oh hell yeah i'm wearing something pink <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not a pink guy, which I'm not against people that wear pink. That's okay. Maybe you just don't feel it's your color. No, I don't. I don't think I, I jive with it, which is fine. But uh, I did this pasty white skin doesn't really go with uh, like the black guys can pull it off. And like uh, Hispanic guys, any like darker skin color looks fantastic in pink. Not your pale pink. Yeah, not just I'm kind of pink as it is. So you yeah, know, it's not pink on pink. It's not going to work. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I'm excited to answer your question. I don't know why um, it might be terrible, but I don't know. It's just something fun. Yes. And I did want to say one thing really quickly before we jump in here. Um, I know last week's episode was kind of a heavy one and at the end it was extra heavy, but we just wanted to thank everybody for their outreach and support and loving words. They really did mean a lot to us. So just a big thank you for that. Yeah. And if I can also just echo the exact same thing, so many people leaving comments and messages and stuff and just supporting us and also the family that that happened to um just so so awesome so some really really awesome listeners thank you so much for just being cool Mm -hmm. absolutely Uh, so do you have anything else to say anything um, else to say for yourself nothing important or entertaining so i'd say let's just get let's get let's get here so this story is the disappearance of andrew gosden and this is a listener suggestion a second one that meg has sent to us so thank you meg man we got to put her on the payroll i know right So Andrew Paul Gosden was born on July 10th, 1993 to parents Kevin and Glennis Gosden. The family also included Andrew's younger sister, Charlotte. They lived in Balby, which is a suburb of Doncaster, South Yorkshire, England. Both Kevin and Glennis were committed and Angelican. I just, we Anglican. just, Anglican. Anglican. It's like, am I demented? We, we, we literally just listened to we it. We went to YouTube, listened to three different versions, all said the same thing. They were all Anglican. So. And I said it about three times too. So I have dementia. So that's cool. 
So, but they didn't push the religion on their children. They let them make their own decisions. They didn't baptize them because they wanted them, like I said, to make their own decisions, not impose their views on their children, which I thought was was nice. Yeah, and that's really cool if you can do that. Mm -hmm. And at the time of this story, Andrew had not gone to church in about 18 months. He'd previously also been a member of the Club Scouts, but by this time he was also no longer involved in that. The Club Scouts? Club Scouts. Did you say club? Mm -hmm, I did say club okay, scouts. So maybe in the UK mm -hmm. it's club scouts. So Kevin described his son as a home bird, which I love that terminology, who rarely left the house. He always told his parents where he was going when he did leave. Andrew's family described him as quiet, though clever and extremely intelligent and gentle. He attended the Macaulay Catholic High School. He was very smart. He took part in the Young, Gifted, and Talented program, which is designed to enhance the educational development of students that are in the top 5% of their class. Being part of this group meant that, you know, straight A's are just the expectation. And it sounds like it was kind of easy for Andrew. He just was very smart. And Andrew was described as a prize-winning mathematician who seemed to be destined to attend Cambridge University. Despite Andrew's intelligence and his 100% attendance record, he was described as having a neutral attitude towards school. He hoped that his upcoming year would be more challenging since previously it felt like he was just cruising through his education. Wow. I guess that's the thing when you're that intelligent. It's like it takes a lot to challenge you. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? I'm watching this uh, show that there's a really smart person. And it seems like a lot of it's like just memory, like being able to recall things because that's all a lot of education is. It's like, what's the right way to do this? Whether mm -hmm. it's writing or mathematics or whatever it might be. Mathematics, so it's like something just has to click. Uh, it's uh, for me, it was just or remembering formulas and stuff. As long as you remember the formulas, when to put those in, then you're good. I was watching the Gilmore Girls. Our daughter and I are just like obsessed with the Gilmore Girls, and they were doing this math work on the board. And I was looking at them and then listening to the teacher. I'm like, he may as well be speaking French right now because whatever he's saying means nothing to me. So he was very smart. Yeah, and I am not. So <laughs> yeah, it's okay. You're smart. Just not good at tests. So during the summer of 2006, Andrew attended Lancaster University, wanted to make sure I said that right, as part of a two-week program with the Young, Gifted, and Talented program. Um, again, it's for the those that are in the top 5% academically. It's also for students ages 11 to six, 16 who are, are very smart. When he came back from the program, his parents recalled that he was enthused about his experience. Kevin and Glennis indicated that Andrew was happy with his own company, but he wasn't a loner. He did keep to a small group of like-minded friends. Outside of school, though, he didn't really spend much time with these people. It was more of them conversing while they were in class together. When he would get home, he, would, he was very happy to just do his own thing. Andrew didn't exhibit any signs of depression. There was no indication that he had been on the receiving end of any kind of bullying. Andrew's teachers felt that he was shy, quiet, and mature beyond his years. He was a deep thinker who rarely got worked up or moody. Kevin felt that his son was absent-minded. He was not streetwise, which could potentially make him vulnerable. Andrew had owned several mobile phones over the years between ages 10 and 12, though he rarely used them, and eventually he ended up losing them. So several, okay, so same phone number, probably just lost them. Yeah, the, okay. just didn't really keep track of his cell phone. Didn't know if that was anything with the story. No, it's not. Um, I guess you could say it kind of is, because he, at the time of the story, doesn't have one. So um, he lost it a couple of, so he did end up getting another one. He lost it a couple years later, shortly before the story took place. His parents did offer to replace it. He said, no, I would prefer that you spend the money and get me an Xbox because that was more important to him. So he did love reading. He read Lord of the Rings, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. He loved metal bands such as Slipknot, Muse, and Funeral for a Friend. These were amongst his favorites. Huh, man. I've never heard of Funeral for a Friend. I haven't either. I would guess it was UK, but okay. I'm a fan of those other ones. Mm -hmm. So on the morning of Friday, September 14th, 2007, Andrew woke up later than what was normal for him. He had a difficult time getting out of bed that morning. His mood seemed a little annoyed, which wasn't his typical character. He's described as very even keeled. So he left the house at 8.05 a.m., and a family friend who was Reverend Alan Murray was sitting on a bench in the park. He saw Andrew cross Westfield Park for the bus stop that he utilized every day to get to school. That evening, the Gosden family were getting ready to sit down to dinner. Charlotte was in her room on her laptop, and Cle uh, Kevin and Glennis were visiting with a family friend. They were just sitting there in their house as a typical evening went on, assuming their son 
was in his room or this room where he would use to play his Xbox games. Didn't even think about it. So they thought he was in the converted cellar, which is where he kept his video games. And he oftentimes gathered in the space after he came home from school. So it was just an assumption based on what was normal. So when his parents called for him to come to dinner, there was no sign of Andrew. They went to his bedroom. They found his Macaulay Catholic high school blazer and tie draped neatly over the back of his chair They later found that his school shirt and his pants were inside the washing machine. Kevin and Glennis went on to make several phone calls. They were starting to become frantic, trying to figure out where their son was, because again, he's the type of kid that is a homebody or a home bird, as as his dad said. And if he was going to go somewhere, they were always made aware of it. So this was very much out of character. So they started to make phone calls to figure out if anyone had seen him Ultimately, they discovered that he was not at school that day, which only, you know, increased their worry because, again, he had a 100 percent attendance record. He's not going to just mess that up. Right. So um, they ultimately found out that the school was aware of the fact that Andrew wasn't there. They called it in you know, to let the family know that he wasn't, they left a message, but it was the wrong number. So they ultimately left a message on somebody else's phone. So they called the police at 7 PM to report Andrew missing at the time. They believe that something must have happened to him as he made his way to school that day. So family and friends came together to search for Andrew until it was dark. Kevin and Charlotte searched the neighborhood. They followed the route that Andrew would have taken to get to school but there was absolutely no sign of him. And to Kevin, he had a feeling as if his son had literally just disappeared from the face of the earth hmm. because he's just thinking, I, I don't know. I have no idea where he is. Well, probably because of the situation he was in, he was at, at home doing everything that's normal and nothing was amiss. And then, you know, just all of a sudden you call him down for dinner. It's like, it's imagine somebody in your house, you know, you, you think they're in a room, like mm-hmm. the whole time you're thinking they're there. It's like, hey, uh, come on. Hello, where are you? And then you look around and you're, all of a sudden you start freaking it out. And it's like you don't even know where to begin because they're just not there and they're not where they should be. And it's like your mind can go a million miles a minute. Yeah. So he described it um, feeling that it was psycho- psychologically impossible to deal with the, this feeling that he was feeling. So within three hours of his disappearance, a missing person flyer was created and distributed. After heading to the bus stop that morning, Andrew did not get on the bus. Instead, he walked to an ATM at a nearby garage. He took out about 200 pounds, which in U.S. dollars is equivalent to about $259. And he took this out from his own bank account, which contained a total of 214 pounds, but it would only allow him to take them out in 20-pound increments. He was then seen walking back home on a neighbor's security camera. It was obvious that Andrew had waited for his family to leave until he actually came back to his house. When he got home, he took off his school uniform, and then this is where everybody, the family found it where it was. He draped the blazer and the tie on the back of the chair. He put his shirt and pants into the wash, and he changed into a black Slipknot t-shirt, which was one of his favorite uh, shirts that he owned, as well as black jeans. He gathered his PlayStation portable system, his wallet, keys, and a backpack, and the backpack was covered in patches of rock and metal bands. At the time, he was a slim-built kid. Um, Some people said despite his age of 14, they would guess he was maybe more like 12 years old, you know, on first glance. Mm -hmm. He stood at about 5'3", with light brown hair, brown eyes, and required strong prescription glasses. No other possessions were identified as missing, and he had left his passport as well as his PlayStation charger behind. He did not seem to have taken a sweatshirt or a coat with him. Of course, it's not it's not cold at this point in time. Temperatures in midday at the time were right around 70 degrees or Fahrenheit or 21 degrees Celsius. Uh, speaking as a gamer, you know, he had this portable PlayStation system, mm-hmm. which is pretty much like a Game Boy or whatever, a Nintendo Switch kind of thing. And you need that charger. So if mm-hmm. you're planning on being gone for a long time, you definitely need that thing. That was my thought, especially since he loves gaming. Yeah. That... I mean, what are what's important to a teenage kid that age? Right. Their games. Yeah, absolutely. So the charger is pretty damn important. I could see a teenager forgetting his sweatshirt, but the the charger that was very telling to me too. 
So despite taking the time to go to the ATM to withdraw the money that he did, which was the 200 pounds, he left 100 pounds just sitting in his room. Hmm. This was 100 pounds that he had saved up from various birthdays. And by the way, 100 pounds is worth about 130 US dollars. So when he left the house, it was 8.30 a.m. From here, he could be seen on his neighbor's security camera walking on Littlemore Lane towards Westfield Park. He was heading to Doncaster train station. Andrew purchased a 3140 pound ticket. It was a one-way ticket only to London. The clerk informed him that he could purchase a return ticket for as little as one pound, but he declined. Mm. He said he would not be returning. At 9.35 a.m., Andrew boarded the train to London, and two hours later, he arrived at King's Cross Station. A woman who sat next to him on the train to London indicated that Andrew was quiet. He just played a game on his PSP and just kept to himself. There was really nothing to take note of. Okay, so this is all factual here. Mm -hmm. Wow. A boy resembling Andrew was seen later that day at Pizza Hut on Oxford Street in London, and his parents believe that this was Andrew. They believe that the sighting was accurate. Kevin and Glennis could not wrap their heads around why Andrew would have wanted to leave or where he was going. What, what was the reason why he got on that train that day? Yeah, I'm sure you're going to tell us, but I mean, you know, just him starting the day and being a little bit more different than usual. Just you know, a little bit, yeah. you know, just had a trouble getting out of bed and wasn't as maybe chipper or even keeled as usual. Yeah. So they were unaware of any problems or struggles that he may have been dealing with. And they again said that he, it, to their knowledge, he was not dealing with depression. Charlotte, his sister felt that as his sister, she would have hoped that Andrew would have at least opened up to her about anything. You know, sometimes it's easier to relate to somebody your own age versus your parents. And, you know, she, in her mind, struggles with this idea and felt that perhaps she let him down as his sister no 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 not not at all and you know obviously that's an easy thing to do mm -hmm. but some kids are more likely to share some things you know and some aren't we have one kid that loves to share things and one kid that won't share anything right we have so. to like yank it out of them yeah so three days after Andrew went missing, police spoke with the ticket agent who sold him the train ticket to London. Kevin didn't find it odd that Andrew had only purchased a one-way ticket since he did have family there. His grandparents were there as well as other family members. And he theorized that maybe he went on the train with the idea of going to see family. So, however, you know, the police did speak with all relatives that did live in London they were cleared of any involvement. None of them had seen Andrew, so he did not make contact with them when he got to London. Andrew had been given the opportunity to travel alone to London to stay with his grandmother during the summer holiday, which is typically between July and September, though he chose not to go. And at the time of the story, Andrew is only eight days into the new school year. So he would have just been given the opportunity to be in London for the summer and, and didn't want to. So why why now? Hmm. You know, there's a lot of questions here. He had something planned, probably. So Kevin and Glennis had noticed changes in his normal routine when on two occasions in the days leading up to his disappearance, he walked home from school rather than taking the bus. And this was a four mile or 6.4 kilometer walk, which would have likely taken him about an hour and 20 minutes. It's a long ass walk. It is, especially after a long school day. Yeah. And you have a bus that will take you to the station just, you know, minutes from your house. I mean, if I'm going hiking, a four mile walk's like a nice hike. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas that four mile walk, that's, that's a long way. It's a commitment. Yeah. So Kevin and Glennis indicated that Andrew did enjoy London. He liked visiting the museums, the exhibitions. And according to Kevin, he was comfortable and knowledgeable in navigating the public transport system around the city because they did have family there. They would go. So it's not like he had never been to London and it was this like foreign world to him. Well, that's good news. So when police spoke with Kevin, he indicated that nothing seemed amiss the evening before he'd gone missing. It was very uneventful and typical. They ate together as usual. They all washed up, you know, the dinner dishes in the kitchen after dinner. Andrew and Kevin worked on a puzzle together for about an hour. And then Andrew watched some comedy shows on TV with his mom. CCTV footage of Andrew arriving at King's Cross wasn't located until 27 days after he had gone missing. He was seen on CCTV footage at the train station. It was 11.25 a.m. and he was walking out the front en entrance of the station. And this is the last confirmed sighting of Andrew. 
from here, we have no idea. So the the pizza place may have been afterwards, but it's not confirmed. It would have it would hundred percent be afterwards because it was after he had already arrived in London. But again, there's not video confirmation of this. It's only speculation. Yeah, this is the last hundred percent. Hundred percent. This is him. Got it. So it's again, it's unknown why Andrew went to London. He had again been there before. He had enjoyed it, but he had never had any desire up until this point to go by himself. And you know, you look at as a parent or whoever any family member you look at some of the things that happened they would have given you an idea of that and like the walking thing like you know maybe he just wanted to walk more maybe he wanted more exercise you mm-hmm. know like anything like people can change their habits all the time um doesn't mean that they're planning on doing something you know that they shouldn't so right it could be that he just wanted a change of pace hey, i'm yeah. just gonna walk today it's a beautiful day but the more information like that you give to the police the better their investigation goes right so they of course are racking their brains thinking what could it possibly be one idea is the band 30 seconds to mars was, was performing that night at brixton Acad- academy and he may have gone to see them oh he would 100 percent. if he likes muse 30 seconds of mars uh i was it's so funny when you said muse i was thinking 30 seconds really wow that that'd be a big one yeah yeah so that's a possibility and then there's a band called sixth it's s-i-k-t-h they were also set to perform that night for the rescheduled farewell show at the carling academy it had originally been scheduled for july 7th but they moved it to this date again this was a very unique event since it was the last show for the original vocalist so it might be one of those things it's like hey it's now or never I got to catch this. But is he the type of kid to do that? No, he's so, not at okay. all. So it's, I don't think those are... Uh, but yeah. he is huge into music. Sure. So um, retired head of Metropolitan Police's Central Images Unit believed that this idea was very possible. He asked that anyone with photos or videos taken at the concert please come forward so that super recognizers could be used to scan these images. And just to let you know, this is a term that was coined in 2009 two years after uh, Kevin went missing. It's people that can quickly scan something and their eyes can like hone in on what it is they're looking for. Like they'd be pros at like, where's Waldo? That's incredible. I know. Isn't it funny how the human brain can be? Yeah, that's uh, that's amazing. That's so cool to have that. And how one brain can do it and one like I'm like looking at the photo like, oh, where the hell is Waldo? <laughs> You're like, uh, he's not here. <laughs> Waldo Waldo is not on this page. This is a joke. And a super recognizer is like, Waldo's right there. <laughs> I've been looking at him the whole time. <laughs> So, um, you know, they did, I'm sure, have a bunch of people come forward with videos and and photos, and I'm sure they did look at them. They didn't see anything. So also the band H.I.M. was holding a promotional signing at HMV Music Store on Monday, September 17th. This would have been three days after Andrew disappeared. But that same evening, they were also performing at an invitation-only show. Again, the only way for this, though, is you'd have to complete, compete in various contests and giveaways. Did Andrew do this? There was no no sign of that. Well, this is interesting because London, you know, one of the biggest cities in the world, obviously. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm sure on. there's a ton of different concerts going on on every, any given night, you know, whatever people. So it's tough. I mean, they got to chase those leads, but still. Right. So again, this idea was investigated, did not come up with any leads. Kevin suspected, this is his dad, that, you know, maybe Andrew went to London with the idea of the easier to seek forgiveness than ask permission mentality. Like, oh, I want to get to this band. My parents, you know, they're going to say no. I'm just going to do it and then apologize after the fact. That's what I do at work. I do that at work all the time. It's a possibility. And I'll tell you what, kids, it works quite a bit. So, I mean, don't do anything stupid, but right, yeah, uh, do it at work once you're older. <laughs> so it was also speculated that Andrew may have traveled to see someone that he had met online. This idea was ruled out, though, because there was no evidence to support this idea. The only computer in the Gosden home was in Char- was Charlotte's laptop, which she had only had for eight weeks at that point, And his family confirmed that he had not used it. He had also, um, he didn't have an email address. He had not set up any kind of online accounts through his Xbox or his PlayStation. Really? No, nothing like that. He just wasn't interested in it. The computer was removed from Andrew's school and the Doncaster library that he could have potentially used 
there was no indication or trace of activity from Andrew. I mean, he's probably smart enough to delete any kind of records. But then, if, you know, you'd, you'd also have like forensic type of IT people that would be able to find that stuff. Yeah, exactly. So Charlotte confirmed that Andrew did not connect with any others socially via the Internet. So this idea was tossed. Man, what is he doing? I know. So London is a city that is saturated with security cameras. So it would be likely that Andrew could have been tracked around London. But again, police did not review any CCTV footage for 27 days. And by the time they did, much of the area footage had already been deleted because it's, you know, on a loop of however many days sure. it starts to delete itself. Yeah, but hey, this kid's missing. Maybe look at the tapes before 27 days. Is yeah. there like a big question of people saying, why the hell did it take so long? So Kevin feels that the South Yorkshire police handled the case in a very slow and chaotic and disorganized way. It was actually the family, not the police, who obtained the video footage from their neighbor's home of Andrew walking to the train station. It was also the family who spoke with the train station employee at Doncaster uh, Station who sold the ticket to Andrew, as well as a man who sat opposite him on the train as far as Peterborough. So... A lot of the legwork, it seemed, was coming from the family. Yeah, like the police were doing close to nothing, basically. Or at least if they were doing something, whatever they were doing was not getting any answers. Right. So the South York South Yorkshire force indicated that they had asked British Transport Police or the BTB to search CCTV footage within two days of Andrew disappearing, though they were unable to find him amongst the crowds. An officer was then sent to London to review the footage, and that's when um, Andrew was ultimately spotted. But again, it took 27 days. Stupid, ridiculous. So had it been, say, three days, the area footage would have still been intact, and then they could have followed where he went. I mean, as the South Yorkshire police, don't they know this? Don't they know that there's probably a time limit on this? Time's a tick in here. Yeah. They could have probably seen exactly where he went. Right. And the the solution is not to extend that time. The solution is for the police to get off their ass and go find this information quickly. It's just, it's tough to process because it's like he just got through their fingers. No, he was sitting there in the fingers the whole time if they would have looked at that video. I know, but they didn't. Ugh. So it's that's a that's tough. I, I really feel for the the family and <laughs> family. That. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the images that would cycle around of Andrew um, was in the media was a close up of his right ear because it had a very distinctive double ridge. So that would set him apart from somebody else that could potentially look like a five foot three kid walking around the city. So, you know, they're trying because, again, London's a huge city. Put the kid's image out. You have enough eyes on the street to spot this kid. Again, he had these, like, very much needed prescription glasses. He could not ever take them off unless he went to an eye doctor to get contact lenses. They were a very strong prescription. So, you know, it's just in- insane to me that he could just go missing just like this. And yeah. like what his dad said, it's like he fell off the face of the earth. And it's not like somebody took him there. Like he went there on his own. Mm-hmm. And the reported sightings of Andrew at Pizza Hut and Covent Garden were also not followed up on. Um, just real quick, I looked up London's population, 8.9 million Oof. compared to New York, uh, 8.3 million. Okay, so, so about neck and neck. Picture like yeah, even more people than New York. Yeah. Which I'm, it's probably larger. You know, I'm guessing. I don't know. I don't but, know. You know, uh, just a lot of people footage wise imagine being lost, one kid lost in new york <clears throat> that's a lot for americans everybody else in london you already know what you're looking you know at. you could say it's easier and harder at the same time because it's so saturated there's so many faces but then again there's so many eyes on the street that you'd be more likely to spot him yeah and so, especially making news you want you want to find a kid who's out mm-hmm. on his own 100 percent. you know this poor family is just going through hell a kid with like coke bottle glasses you know i mean that that's pretty easy to spot yeah so again, Andrew was cited, or reportedly so, at the Pizza Hut and Covent Gardens, but they said that the police really never followed up on this lead. Oh my God, if I hear more of this, and I'm sure I'm going to. <laughs> the woman who actually said she saw him at these locations or location was not spoken with for about six weeks. She's like, police, uh, I just said that I f- saw this person. Do you want to talk to me? They're like, oh yeah, we'll get to you um, eventually. I know, Ma'am. I can't wrap my head around it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, Kevin is feeling his dad feels like the police spent so much of their time trying to put the cause of Andrew's disappearance on him. And it seemed like him specifically, not the family, but him. And, you know, they were suggesting abuse or even murder. 
Kevin said that he himself, and this is so sad, had tried to commit suicide so that maybe the police would then start to take his son's case seriously. He tried to commit suicide? Apparently or? so. I don't know Jeez. how how this was, sure. but That's pretty the sick. point is, it's like he wanted to take their eyes off of him and focus on his missing son. They're, he's like, they're, you're looking in the wrong place. The weird thing is, is there's CCTV video of him walking to the station and then arriving in London. Why would they think his dad was involved? That they they didn't find any of that till later, right? Twenty eight, twenty seven days. days. But it's, so in the meantime, that whole twenty seven days, they're grilling they're focusing Kevin on here. Kevin. Yeah, man, that's that's horrible. And I know it's the CCTV footage in London that took twenty seven days. I'm not sure how long it took for the video cameras of the neighbors. I would imagine that would be a lot quicker. Yeah, well, you just ask them. Say, exactly. Hey, can I see yeah. it? Um, and. Yeah, that, oh man, can you imagine being the family, just being like, please, man, <laughs> even if you're, I, I get looking into Kevin, I get looking closer, you know, like we always say, you start in the inner circle and then work your way out, but maybe do both at the same time. Well, and we know Kevin wasn't at home, so where was he? So, okay, if, say, this happened to our family, they would give a ring-a-ding to my employer, hey, was Allison at work on whatever day? Yeah, she was here, did and she, we have security scanning? camera footage of yeah. it if you want to see it. Right. Okay, Allison was there. Boom, done. Right. So what's the deal with that? I don't know. None. I really can't no say. Deal. So um, up to three years after Andrew left, we still don't know anything. Police still, according to Kevin's family, or um, Andrew's family, Kevin is saying this, still were pulling the family over to search their car. Gee, they've got something about this family, man. I'm not saying, <laughs> now. don't... I, they may have done something to push him away, right? That I don't know. We allegedly. don't know the inner workings sure. of any family. Right, right. Now, I'm not trying to say they did. I'm just saying no. anything's possible. If, if, you know, some of Andrew's family members are listening, you know, as far as we know, anything could be possible. But, I mean, we have him in London here. So let's, like, focus over there. Right, exactly. Nobody knows what happens behind anybody's closed doors. You know, we could shut this camera off and then I could, you know, be terribly abusive to Mike. I'm going to tell you that. They all know that I'm the mean one in this relationship. They do. They do. The point is, <laughs> do they have any reason to believe this? Because, of course, they're going to talk to family and friends. Hey, were the Gosdens kind of an angry bunch that, the, you know, they would torment their kids? No, there weren't. Why would you think that they were? Yeah, if there's any evidence pointing to sure, it. Sure, if there's any evidence, and I know they're talking to family and friends. Right. So I don't get it. So, again, three up to three years later, they were still searching the car to see if there was any evidence that Andrew was with them or something. So within a year following Andrew's disappearance, 122 potential sightings were reported across the UK, which all turned out to be false leads. In November of 2008, more than a year after Andrew vanished, a man came to the Leo Minster police station after business hours. He claimed to have information about the case. He spoke over the intercom, but by the time someone could attend to him, he had left. A man claiming to be this same person wrote in an anonymous letter to BBC after Andrew's case was featured on The One Show. In this letter, he claimed to have seen Andrew in Shrewsbury in November of 2008. It has not been confirmed if this man is the same person that spoke over the intercom of the police station. Um, it was the second anniversary of Andrew's disappearance in September of 2009 when the Gosden family released age-progressed photos of what he could potentially look like at age 16. Kevin questioned if his son had been potentially struggling with his sexual orientation, and in November of 2009, he asked for help from the gay community in finding Andrew. Uh, Ke any details around why they would think that? Just basically trying to explore any possible option of right. what it could have been. What would cause him to escape? Exactly. Escape what would drive him to want to run away? Yeah. You know, so that was just a thought. Um, Kevin said that they are a pretty open family, but he did wonder if Andrew just found it too awkward just to openly speak with his parents. Wait, did you say they're members of the Anglican Church? Yes. Ah, uh, okay. But so, again, they're very open-minded. They sure. didn't make their kids come to church. They didn't baptize them. They wanted them to make their own choices. Right. So that seems very open-minded to me. Yeah. Again, he, he just questioned if maybe his son just felt it was just too awkward, awkward of a conversation to have and that maybe it was just easier to leave. Who knows? Um, he says that the, their love of their son is unconditional. They would never have had any issues with it. Kevin felt that in his heart that Andrew's decision to leave was a spur of the moment one. That's his thought. 
In 2011, four years had passed without any information or leads, so the family hired specialists to conduct sonar scans over the River Thames, which flows through London. Within the search, a body was found, how crazy is that, but it did not belong to Andrew. In 2016, Andrew's parents asked that anyone come forward with information that they uh, were, you know, speaking on an episode of BBC's Panorama. If you've seen him, again, they're sharing age-progressed photos of what he could potentially look like. The following year, in 2017, the charity Missing People UK made Andrew the face of their campaign, Find Every Child, and he was featured on billboards nationwide. On September 12, 2017, police made a fresh appeal for information and asked that anyone come forward with any, any information. The South Yorkshire Police Facebook page indicated that they were or had been investigating requests for similar optical prescriptions to Andrews to help match it. Because, oh, again, smart. it was, you know, a very specific, strong prescription. Smart. Um, they were requesting documents from the passport office or national insurance and circulating his DNA, fingerprints, dental and health records, which suggested that it's their belief that Andrew may still be alive. Police also do annual checks on John Doe's in hospitals. In June of 2018, Andrew's parents indicated that a person reported an online communication with an indiv individual with the username Andy Rue who stated that their boyfriend broke up with them and they needed about 200 pounds or $259 to pay for the rent. When someone offered to send them money, the person said that they didn't have a bank account due to the fact that they left home when they were only 14. Ah. So when police looked into this lead, they were unable to locate this person. Ah. You know, online it's hard because you can go, you can ghost people. Sure. Just delete your account. Yeah, disappear. Have a burner phone or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And 2000, a 2017 article indicated that even after 10 years had passed, the family still clung to hope that someday Andrew might just walk through the door. His bedroom has since been repainted and the band posters have been taken down, though he, th his clothes are still in his drawers with his band t-shirts. He has his rock and gem collection still sitting on the shelf. A family of Andrews since age six, who is 24 year old Sandy Murray, she splits her, or I'm sorry, he splits his time between Yorkshire and London. And while he's in the city, he keeps an eye out for somebody that could potentially be Andrew. On January 11th, 2022, South Yorkshire police announced that they had arrested two men aged 38 and 45 on December 8th, 2021, on suspicion of kidnapping and human trafficking. The 45-year-old was also arrested on suspicion of processing or possessing, I should say, indecent images of children. At the time of their arrest in London, police said that electronics taken from the men could take 6 to 12 months to analyze. And that's kind of where we are with that. They have since been released, though it is their belief that these men have something to do with Andrew's disappearance. There is really no information. You see on my that. face, like so. <laughs> well, like, I have so many questions about this. Before you ask any questions, so so there is some kind of a link, but obviously because of the investigation, police yeah. aren't willing to share. It's an active investigation. That is what we know. Why are they linking these men to Andrew? I'm so curious to know because. From my knowledge, the only known contact with Andrew was that day he disappeared and walked out the doors of the train station. So what what do they know to connect these men to him? Hmm. I don't know. So hopefully time will tell and we'll find out. Um, again, these men remain suspects in Andrew's case and the case is still an active investigation. Andrew's family go over and over in their heads what could have happened to their son once he arrived in London and walked through those train station doors never to be seen again. What happened? Where did he go? Kevin now suffers from anxiety, depression, PTSD, and suicidal thoughts. What about Glennis? They don't say much about Glennis. Um, obviously, she's Andrew's mother, and I'm sure she's suffering. It just seems like um, Kevin is more of the spokesperson of the family. And so he you was the hear, target of the police, too. Yeah, so you hear more of what are his thoughts. I can only imagine the hell his mother is going through, speaking as a mom and a, and a human myself. Um, Charlotte continues to speak of Andrew in the present tense because until she knows otherwise, that's the assumption. She says it becomes more and more difficult with each passing year. She wonders what 
he would be like if they met today and even questions if she could potentially walk right by him on the street and not even know that that's her brother. hundred percent. You know, might have really long hair and mm-hmm. you know, beard and whatever, and just not even look like him. It's gotta be kind of a crazy thought. Yeah. Like I could walk by a person and not know that it was my brother. Yeah. That's, that's tough. So I, I really do feel for them. Uh, Because they continue to hold out hope that he may come home one day, they refuse to leave the family home. Kevin feels a fresh start and a new location could be a good thing for them. But in the same sense, he knows that if Andrew is still alive and decides to come home, he'll know then where to find them. Whereas if they move and relocate, you know, that takes that idea away. Yeah, but it's 2023. 20, You're going to be able to find people no matter how. I mean, Andrew yeah. seems like a smart fella. Um, I'm sure he can find where his family... And I, I could see I where it. his family's coming from. Yeah, it's more of an emotional thing. Kevin writes in his blog that he, su- again, he suffers from a crippling anxiety and depression to the point that it's barely possible for him to function. So it's like he's living in hell ever since his son just disappeared. Andrew's family wasn't able to celebrate his 30th birthday with him, which was just July 10th, 2023. Kevin spoke out saying that no matter how much time has gone by without him, the feelings never change and are often intensified by seemingly small things that wouldn't have been a problem before he vanished. Despite the passing time, Andrew is still missed intensely, and every single day, it, it just never seems to become easier. Like they all say, time heals all wounds. It just doesn't seem to be the case. You know, it's still fresh for them. It's still terrible. When Andrew was 10 years old, he read that if an oak tree were planted in a tub, it could become a fully mature tree in a a miniature form. Since the roots aren't allowed to grow fully, it just stays a smaller size but becomes fully mature. So he wanted to test this theory. He planted a few acorns in a tub. Half a dozen grew, and Kevin gradually replanted them over the years, keeping one for their back garden. Last year, it produced its first acorns, which proved Andrew's theory that while still only six feet tall, it matured just as he expected. That oak tree is now kept in memory of Andrew, and he writes in his blog, when I say he, Kevin, and this blog that I'm referring to is Help Us to Find Andrew. So he wrote in this um, blog, as Andrew's oak tree bears the fruit of the acorn, we hope that awareness of his case bears the fruit that others are helped to find positive solutions in their lives and that other families are spared the pain that too many of us live with every day. Um, So this year is 16 years that Andrew has gone missing. Uh, There's a message that his family writes to Andrew on the blog, and it says, Dear Andrew, we have all missed you so much since the day you left. Not a day goes by that you are not in our minds constantly. You were always so witty, polite, caring, and intelligent, and we desperately miss your company. The same is true for all your friends and the thousands of people who have prayed for you and to help search for you. If you should ever read this, forget about any water under the bridge and please have no fear about making contact with us. We do not care where you have been or what lifestyle you have chosen for yourself. We only want to know that you are safe and well and to help support you if we can. We remain as proud of you as we have always been and love you deeply. All our love, Dad, Mom, and Charlie. Kevin and Glennis ask that, you know... To help in finding Andrew, you can keep your eyes open, report any potential sightings of Andrew to police, display a poster of Andrew to raise raise awareness of this case, put a link to his website, which is Andrew's family's blog, on a social media networking site, and consider supporting missing child organizations and charities. And when we do the post, we'll post the age progress photos of what he could potentially look like now that he's 30 years old. Yeah, and obviously show notes will have a link to all that Mm -hmm. stuff too. Oh, man. So that's that's really hard on that family. I was hoping for a nicer ending. Yep. Um, and it, it's really scary about the whole child trafficking thing, because if that's part of it, you know, I don't know. So that's where I was, too, because, you know, there was that report of the Andy Rue username saying, hey, I need money for rent because I, I don't have a bank account. I left home when I was 14. That gave me hope that, you know, he's just living in London. And, you know, he just wanted to avoid having a conversation with his mom, mom and dad about the fact that he's gay. But then when I learned of the arrests, 
you know. Yeah, I mean, he could have been trafficked. Is yeah, you know, maybe he met somebody online and they're like, "Hey, come and meet, and we can make out or whatever." And that turned out to be a child trafficker. And maybe, hopefully, he got through that, which is probably a horrible nightmare, and then became an adult. Now, you know, probably, man, he's probably so embarrassed of whatever may have happened. But like his family said, mm-hmm. man, it's, it's all in the past. Speaking as a father, I don't care. Like whatever happened, happened. Just come home. We want to give you hugs and make everything better. That's right? exactly what I was going to say. Like no matter the circumstance. Our arms are wide open for you to welcome you back in this house. If you tell us you want no questions asked, there will be no questions asked. We'll never talk about any of it. We, we just want to know you're okay. We want to just love you and move forward in the in the years that we have together with you. The new relationship starts right now, July of 2023. Yeah. And, you know, it's just so hard for them. It must be so hard to just not know. And I'm just hoping that something comes of the arrest with these two guys, which, again, of course, they have been released. But police say, you know, they, are, they believe there is a strong connection. Yet we released. just know nothing, okay. but yet they were released because I guess they have to build the case or something. I don't know. Yeah, I don't trust the South Yorkshire police, unfortunately, based on the, uh, what they've done so far. But yeah, hey, maybe there's on new the people. Information. Maybe new people. Involved. Yeah, because it has been. What did I say? Sixteen years. Yeah, I'm sure the chief is gone. Uh, he should have been. Uh, definitely reprimanded for lack of 27 days yeah a lot of times we do hear good police work this is not one of those cases yeah i mean i just i can't wrap my head around why it took 27 days to locate this kid walking out the front door yeah because you know he got on the 9 30 train you know it took about two hours to get to london you're looking at, especially like you know what platform that train went to right why was it so hard to find him on the cctv footage insane I don't know. It's it's like gross. That's the perfect place. It's like an airport. You know, you know which plane that the, the terminal it went to. You know where to look. If you guys know us, you know, we'll give credit where credit's due. But this is definitely a horrible police job. It just sounds very lazy and sloppy. And that's what Kevin absolutely reinforced that. He said it was very slow moving, very sloppy. They put all their efforts into making him the bad guy sure that and he I must have left because of abuse it sounds like kevin would understand that be like okay yeah yeah look into me all you want whatever it needs to be i'll give you all the information but in the meantime how about you look elsewhere too while bob talks to me about what's happening here how about ted go and review this fit- footage or whatever yeah. you know like let's disperse the help here right so it's just really hard to imagine you know and i just hope that this case will despite 16 years passing have resolution that they will eventually be reunited with their son again i know we have a lot of uk listeners i mean if you have any input on this anything new or whatever happening or your thoughts on the subject please leave it in the comments on our instagram or on spotify um there's actually a spot for leaving comments too yeah and my other question is do you ever see billboards around the city with the age progress photos of andrew like is this case still talked about over in London. There's so many, so many missing kids, unfortunately, yeah. where it's like, how can you give priority to one? I guess because you know he got off at that train. Like, you know he's there. It's not like he disappeared and we don't know where he went. We know he went to London. But by now he's 30. So it's like he can fend for himself. Now. Or he could be in Dubai or right. wherever. Right, right. Anywhere in the world. He didn't take his passport, though. Yeah, but well, there's plenty of like eight year olds and six year olds that are missing that yeah. probably, you know, need it too. In every case is equally important i you know i know that yeah so, so well thank you for bringing that to our attention any input anybody has we're, we're definitely uh here listening and if you'd like to support this little mom and pop podcast called uh, crime and coffee couple that's us that's uh, us you can go ahead and look in the show notes go click like click on over to uh patreon uh, i think there's almost 30 bonus episodes out there ranging from a few different levels so go check it out we would appreciate it i want to say welcome to the latest uh crime and coffee couple club members which include Erica, Ginny, and Jessica. So thank you for being, uh, you know, believing in us enough. We really appreciate it. Every time we get those emails, I send them right over to Allison. She sends me a little tadas, the emoji of tada. If you type in tada on your iPhone. Oh, I don't do that. I just do the frequently used. It's the celebration. It's like the confetti going off. Yeah, confetti and hearts. Yeah. I think hearts, hearts yeah. always hearts and confetti. Yeah. So hey, thank you so much for spending some time with us. We really appreciate you. And uh, anything else, sweetheart? That's all. And until next time, bye. bye.